Hey, hi, this is Wahaba, and this will be the concluding video in my introduction to universal worship, the primer thereof. And I finished the last video talking about the feeling tone, ways in which a person who is training in the spiritual adab of spiritual liberty through the ritual of universal worship can come to appreciate and experience the feeling tone of each tradition. And another place where you can begin, of course, is in the writings of Hazrat Nayak Khan, in the same text that I read from earlier at the in the very first of these videos, The Unity of Religious Ideas. Hazrat Nayak Khan does talk about, give brief comments about various of the most pro important prophetic figures uh, in the different traditions that he transmitted, including Abraham and Moses and uh, the Buddha and Krishna and Rama and Zarathustra and Jesus, of course, and then Muhammad. And he also, if you read through these, he also talks about, uh, and when he talks about the Buddha, he also talks about the Jains, uh, who were a very important religious group where he lived in the part of India that he came from, uh, and that a lot of people don't know very much about, and were incredibly important in the development of both Hinduism as we know it today and Buddhism. Uh, and, and he knows that. Uh, and he also knows that they have a relationship with Buddhism specifically uh, in that uh, Lord Mahavir, the uh, the prophet that is connected to Jain, the Jains, actually came into an existence at about the same time that the Buddha did. And, and in India, their stories, the story of the Lord Buddha and Lord Mahavir are actually intertwined. So uh, he does mention the Jains. So he is very aware that there are uh, lots and lots of traditions out there. Uh, but what I wanted to do is read just a little bit from his uh, from his comments about Zarathustra, uh, just to get so that you can get a sense of the kind of feeling tone that he was coming from and how he connected uh, to this particular tradition. Uh, and what you have to remember is that he knew Zoroastrians. They they are they are one of the in fact one of the largest Zoroastrian community in in the world exists in the area of India where he came from. So I'm sure that he knew Zoroastrians, that he met with them, that he spoke to them and was familiar with their traditions. So that's part of the reason why, and, and, and as you probably already noticed, it's a special tradition for me because it was the first tradition um, within the context of universal worship that I connected to in terms of a feeling tone. So this particular prophet and, and tradition have always been very special to me. But as he says here, uh, Zarathustra's spiritual attainment came by his communication with nature first. He appreciated, adored, and worshipped the sublimity of nature, and he saw wisdom hidden in the whole creation. He learned and recognized from that the being of the Creator acknowledged his perfect wisdom and then devoted his whole life to glorifying the name of God. To those who followed him in the path of spiritual attainment, he showed the different aspects of nature and asked them to see what they could see behind it all. He pointed out to his followers that the form and line and color and movement that they saw before them and which attracted them so much must have been accomplished by an expert artist. It cannot all work mechanically and be perfect. The mechanism, however much perfected, cannot run without the help of an engineer. Therefore he showed to them that God is not an object with the, which the imagination has made, though he is molded by man's imagination outwardly. In reality, God is the being, such a perfect being, that if compared with other living beings of this world, he is beyond comparison. He is the only being. The way of worship taught by Zarathustra was to worship God by offering homage to nature. For nature suggests to the soul the endless and unlimited being hidden behind it all. So, 
the Amesha Spenta, then, are expressions of this. Uh, they are expressions of these different components of nature. Uh, and what I would recommend is you get to know this in Zoroastrianism. Uh, I, what I will say is that uh, in that, that uh, virtual Zoom-sponsored universal worship that was done a month, a month and a half ago in commemoration of the 99th anniversary of the introduction of universal worship to the world, uh, the individual who did Zoroastrianism did a really good job. She, was, she had very clearly connected with feeling tone of, of the prophet and the, the, the practice of light that she offered was simple, it was to the point, and it was completely within the context of the Zoroastrian tradition, uh, and yet done in a way that um, anybody could understand. So she did a really, really good job. I don't remember exactly what her name was. I know she came out of Florida, but she did an excellent job. So she's an, she's an example of something, uh, of a way in which this tradition can be done. And if you look further at uh, the writings here about the different prophets in this particular text, one of the things that you'll notice is that there are a couple of prophets that are given for Hinduism. There's Krishna and there's uh, Rama. Uh, and because, as I'm sure all of you know, the, the Hindu tradition is huge. I think the word ginormous was coined for it. Um, and so it's possible f to use a lot of different approaches with Hinduism. And these are the two that, these are the two prophets that are recommended uh, for, by Hazrat Nayak Khan for our use. Um, when it comes to Hinduism, it is important to try to, to pick texts and pick uh, prophets that the that that most or all Hindus will agree on. Uh, that's why the Bhagavad Gita is often chosen, or the Ramayana is often chosen, or or the uh, or any of the principal Upanishads. There are sixteen of prin principal Upanishads. Um, why 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 they are chosen? Uh, what that means is that all of the principal schools of Hinduism. Uh, refer to them in one way or another. And then, of course, there's the Rig Veda, or the Vedas generally, in which the Rig Veda is probably the easiest one to use. So, um, with Hinduism, there's there's a vast assortment of things that you can choose from. And, and like I said when I mentioned it before, the only thing is, is that if you're going to be using uh, uh, Hinduism or a particular prophet, or a particular text in Hinduism, it's good to try to pick a practice that that then is connected to it. So that, for example, if you do uh, a reading from the Bhagavad Gita, then do uh, then do a chant or a mantra to Krishna. Uh, that you know that makes the most sense. If you're using the Ramayana, uh, then you could do uh, you know something to Lord Rama. Uh, if you're if you're uh, doing something a little older, like from the Vedas or the Upanishads, uh, you could do then the Gayatri Mantra, which is very 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 easy, and there's a lot of really attractive versions of it. Uh, and and actually, the Gayatri, Gayatri Mantra is a really powerful um, piece of poetry if you learn it. So uh, that's the only thing that I would recommend with regard to, to Hinduism is just make sure it's such, because it's such a vast tradition, uh, just make sure that uh, the, the text that you're using and the prophetic, um, the prophetic person or avatar that you're using, uh, that they link up in a certain, in a certain obvious way, because that will then help to attune yourself and and the people to whom you're facil with whom you're facilitating this experience that will help to connect them to the feeling tone that you are attempting to convey there are a couple of other sources that i have found to be useful in coming up with themes uh, for universal worship 
Um, also, again, in this uh, text, The Unity of Religious Ideals, uh, there's a whole chapter that is called The Symbology of Religious Ideals, and it talks about what symbology is specifically for Hazrat Nayak Khan. Uh, but he talks about certain types of symbols that recur in, in most traditions, such as the sun, uh, and, and the way in which the sun is often used as a focus of divine worship or a divine intention. Uh, he talks about uh, music. Uh, he specifies the flute of Krishna, but he also talks about music generally. Uh, he talks about water. He talks about wine. Uh, he talks about um, angels. He talks about uh, struggling with angels. Uh, and then uh, the, the symbol of the cross, the symbol of the dove. Uh, he provides a number of different examples that seem very specific, but actually uh, are symbols that can be found across traditions in various ways. Another place that I have found really useful is if you have, if you have um, the volume, it can be the orange volume or the more recently published volume of Hazrat Nayak Khan's, all of his sayings, his compiled sayings, there's an index in the back of that uh, book that provides some really good examples of themes, ideas that can be used for themes uh, for universal worship services, and some that are you, you, that are unexpected. Um, some really interesting things connected to prayer uh, or to contemplation. So uh, there, there are a variety of places in which you can find themes if you're having trouble coming up with something, you know, something that's topical. So what, so in conclusion, what I wanted to say is use the ideas in these videos uh, to the best of your ability. Keep in mind that um, I was, I have been speaking only from my experience. Uh, I have been speaking from my training and um, the the processes that I have gone through in order to be a a good facilitator um, of the universal worship service and a decent ceremony a, a ceremony giver you know someone who gives ceremony um, and I wish you luck and I wish you all the good feeling tones of all the traditions and the the light and blessing of all the prophets upon you. And I would just conclude with, uh, may the blessings of God rest upon you. May God's peace abide with you. May God's presence illuminate your heart now and forever. Amen.